Documentary TV. It's America's final frontier. Home to 160 million acres of unspoiled wilderness. But here, there's a force more deadly than nature. You find out everything in Alaska. Okay. You we want you it all. The mean streets of Anchorage are the real Wild West. There are crips here, they will kill you. Just to prove that point. You hit me, I'm gonna hit you right back. Each day, Anchorage is more deadly. And Crips don't die, they multiply. No, we throw it down anytime. Now we got this, my People say, oh, there ain't nothing like that going on in Anchorage. You know, y'all up there with igloos and stuff. Now it's, it's going down up here. Anchorage, Alaska's largest city. The unspoiled wilderness is 10 minutes drive from downtown. Even inside the city limits, salmon fill the streams, and hunters are in a sportsman's paradise. But it's a city with a dark side. We do have gangs here in Anchorage. Certainly we have retaliatory shootings, uh, beatings, initiation crimes, robberies, and the homicides. Alaska has more guns per capita than any other state in the Union. Residents here are isolated from the rest of the country, which they call the outside. Up here is the last frontier you know, we enjoy our freedoms immensely here. We fight for constitutional rights. We fight for fairness. But one unwelcome import from the lower 48 states has found its way in. The notorious Crips from LA have migrated to the northern tip of America. Everywhere you go, there's gonna be some sort of gang, some sort of group of people that wanna do something, you know, to somebody, cause it's fun hurting people. <laughs> the gangbangers on these streets are as wild as the rough country, with crews too numerous to count. We have, over the last four years, identified 115 plus different criminal street gangs uh, here in Anchorage. But trust me, with us, we out here every day. Every night, every day. Alaska's Crips are as lawless as their brothers in Compton, but their fraternal code of gang loyalty doesn't apply. Here, money is king. Crips were coming up here because they heard there was a lot of money up here. They were basically trafficking in women, guns, and drugs. And even the youngest are packing heat. Everybody had a gun. I didn't care. I was going to do what I wanted to do, who I wanted to do it to. I really didn't value life all that much. Kushan Johnson, AKA Sleep, was just 12 years old when he became a gangbanger. He learned the hard way that flying anything but the Crips Blue could get him killed. I was walking down the street and uh, I had a red shirt on. They let me know, you better take that shirt off and don't let me see you with that shirt on again. He joined the Crips in 1989 and became part of Anchorage's dark underworld. Sleep was 16 when he was shot for the first time by a stranger at a party. Dude just kind of started popping off. You know, I walked up on him, you know what I'm saying? You know, who you talking to? He pulled out his pistol, and as I snatched it from him, it went off and shot me in the leg. 
Eventually, Sleep was shot three more times. The shootings left him with a taste for blood. After the second time, I became more deadlier. If you say the wrong things, if you, if you, if you even so much to come out of your side of your mouth to talk about, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kill you, you know, it was on a cracker. Crips in Anchorage aren't like their brothers in the lower 48. Their battles aren't over drugs or turf, and they aren't always with other gangs. They're with one another. Even the smallest insult can turn deadly fast. In the gangs that you got up here, you got people turning on each other in the same gang or over, you know, your bag of weed was bigger than mine, you know. Out of mag, just turn on each other. It's different up here. Up here wasn't no turf or territory. It was just wherever. This crip, street name Stomp, asked to have his identity concealed. A native of Hawaii, he moved to Anchorage in 1991 and quickly joined a clique. Two years later, he was almost killed when he confronted a rival gang member at a party. I got into his face, you know, and everybody was like, no, not here. So the, the fight broke up, and then they left. A couple hours later, I walked out the door. All I heard was gunshots. At first, Stomp didn't realize he'd been shot. I thought someone threw a rock at me. My friend said, hey, yo, I see blood, so he left on my shirt. Blood just came out, and then I passed out. Stomp woke up two days later and realized how close he'd come to death. Um, the doctor told me uh, that uh, for about three, four minutes, my heart stopped beating. You lost your large intestines because the bullet did a lot of damage. You're lucky that you look and almost lost you for a second. This surge in violence at the hands of the Crips has Anchorage police in hot pursuit. May 14th, 2005, 7 p.m. Still broad daylight in Anchorage. Kentron Nevitt stopped by a liquor store. At 21, he was a respected mentor of the Soldier Crew, a super gang that recruited Crips and other gangsters. Nevitt had a serious criminal record and a reputation for violence. Outside, two members of the Crips drove up, including their infamous leader, Tinius Talamivo. Tinius, a Samoan, was known as a fearless gangster who managed to stay out of prison despite numerous run-ins with the cops. He also seemed to have nine lives. Tinius had gained a lot of uh, notoriety because he was actually involved in a shooting shot in the head a couple of years prior. He was actually supposed to initially uh, die and then he made a full recovery. Tinius and his crew now followed Kentron into the store. They get into a first verbal confrontation. Some words were exchanged. The argument escalated. And uh, one of them hit him, punched him, and this started a fight. Outnumbered, Kentron struggled with his attackers. Just then, a 15-year-old soldier crew member burst into the store, wielding a 9mm. Came in uh, through the door and just immediately opened up on the Samoan males. A gunfight ensued, shots were fired back. The teenager fired shots at the Crips. He fled the store and Tinius ran after him. The juvenile retreated out, but was actually chased down by uh, Tinius started running down the alley and was struck in the back of the leg. The teenager was badly wounded, but didn't stop firing at Tinius. During the gun exchange, Tinius was actually struck in the chest several times. The other members of his clique got Tinius into their SUV and rushed him to the hospital. The teenager was left bleeding by the side of the road. By the time the police arrived, 
the teen would be fighting for his life. The bloodiest gang war in Anchorage had begun. That's the way the game is, you know. You hit me, I'm gonna hit you right back. If you hit one of my eyes, we're gonna get one of yours. Anchorage, Alaska. It's the largest city in the largest state in America and a haven for rebels, outsiders, and violent gangs who turn on each other. Motherfuckers look at me wrong, they getting up. Motherfuckers disrespect me, they getting up. The Crips first came on the scene in Anchorage more than 30 years ago at the height of Alaska's oil boom. Cops have been trying to take them down ever since. This is not a problem that started yesterday. This is a problem that has been perpetual. 1977, the Alaska pipeline was completed. It pumped oil to the lower 48 and brought Alaska jobs and money as much as $26 billion in oil revenues. This attracted the attention of a new criminal element. We were getting a lot of people in from all over the world, all backgrounds, and with the good came the bad. We had a lot of, of uh, workers that had a lot of expendable income, uh, and so, you know, drug trade. Crips and Bloods in the lower 48 states heard there was money to be made. Some came up north to deal cocaine and heroin. Legend has it that Alaska police used old school techniques to keep the dealers in check. It was kind of uh, an, an old west uh, law enforcement type tactic. And officers met known gang members coming up from California at the airport and basically told them to leave the state. You're not welcome here. In the late 1980s, as crack ravaged Los Angeles and other major cities, Anchorage was largely gang-free. Many families moved here, hoping to protect their children from increasing gang violence. But those kids secretly brought their colors and their big city attitudes to Anchorage. Families coming up here from Compton, from New York, from Miami, from rough areas, those teens come up here too with, with a mentality that, hey, I'm tougher than you are, or uh, I'm from this gang. By the end of the 80s, informal cliques were forming in middle schools and high schools, right under the noses of the police. I think there was a lot of denial. Uh, they're really not gangs, they just kind of hang out. and Oh yeah, they kind of dress that way, but you know, uh, they're just kids. Things that they were saying on the news too, it was like, oh, we don't have a gang problem, they're just wannabes. And that's a slap in the face right there for somebody that's trying to be. You know what I mean? So uh, we'll show them. Kushan Johnson, AKA Sleep, joined a Crip crew in 1989. He and his friends were running wild in the streets. Some of us didn't have homes, so we'd be out in the streets. And some of us had homes, but didn't really want to go there. So we'd be out running the streets till about five, six in the morning, whoever's parents went to work first, you know what I'm saying? And we all go in the house and eat up some food, take a nap until they get back, and then we back in the streets. But not all the Crips were homegrown. In 1991, 16-year-old Stomp moved from Hawaii to Anchorage. Back home, he ran with the Crips, a life his parents wanted him to leave behind. They had already sent his brother to Anchorage. Now they sent Stomp to join him. Well, during the flight up here, and I was, I was pissed. I was mad. I was like, damn, we're going to be living in igloos. Stomp didn't find any igloos. What he found was more deadly. Plenty of Crips. His brother and his cousin Big 
joined with other Pacific Islanders, who were mostly Crips, to form their own clique, called the Homo Tribe. Big asked to have his identity concealed. It was just the boys from school. <laughs> it was basically like 11 of us. What Homo Tribe lacked in numbers, they made up for with brute force. Well, Pacific Islanders are very large. They would physically assault uh, rival gang members, uh, you know, fist fights, and uh, they were typically winning. By the winter of 1992, there were about 50 Crips in Anchorage in a half dozen cliques. But there was just one gang everyone wanted to beat, the Homo Tribe. And because of their imposing size, there was only one way to do it. It prompted the other gangs to become armed so that they could uh, fight against the Homo Tribe. As the rival gangs started packing, the Homo Tribe boosted its membership. They also increased their own arsenal by robbing homes and gun shops. There was no lack of artillery in Anchorage. The Alaskans like their freedom, they like their firearms. So guns are never of shorthand here in Alaska. Everybody was strapped. Everyone had Glocks, 9mm rifles, assault rifles, we had everything. For the first time, Anchorage experienced the type of gang violence that was plaguing cities in the lower 48. 1995 would become a record year for murder. There were 35 homicides, nearly triple the rate six years prior. The Crips had risen to power in just three years and caught the city completely off guard. Anchorage police were outgunned and overwhelmed. As quickly as the gangs formed, we started seeing graffiti popping up everywhere, and we started seeing the, the cars, you know, loaded up with guys just driving down the streets and shooting houses up or shooting other cars. And the Crips were just getting started. The Homo Tribe moved into the drug market for the first time. All my homeboys, uh, he, he came up with the idea of like, hey, let's take over Anchorage. Let's, let's just start doing drugs and stuff, selling drugs, make money off of drugs. The Homo Tribe set up a pipeline between California and Alaska, moving cocaine and marijuana across state lines. The money started flowing, and gangbangers as far away as Los Angeles took notice. That's where the Crips were getting their supply, driving it up to Alaska one kilo at a time. The cash quickly started rolling in. Just that one trip out of that one kilo, if you spend 16, you know, 20 grand down there, you bring it up here, you're making 40, 50 grand on that. Maybe hundreds, you know, if you break it down. <laughs> That's the plus side of Alaska. Sabrina grew up in L.A. and was a Compton Crip from the age of 15. She and her husband were suppliers in Compton's drug trade. They took notice when some friends who were in the Homo tribe drove from Anchorage to Compton and scored a chunk of cocaine to take back for big profits. Who knows if they slept that whole five days they drove down. And it was the money, the drug.
has kept them motivated to, to accomplish this run, and I couldn't believe that. Sabrina was pregnant with her second child. So when her husband suggested they move their business to Alaska, she was skeptical. I was like, Alaska? All I thought of was igloos and Eskimos. The opportunity to make bank was too tempting. She and her husband moved to Anchorage and set up shop in a local motel. The Homo tribe steered customers her way. With her new baby sitting by her side, Sabrina watched as the dollars rolled in. And I just like, wow, they were more into money out here. Like, we thought we were into money. Alaska's gang are into money. The Homo tribe's business was booming. But success came with a price. The brotherhood that brought the gang together was being torn apart by greed. Loyalty changed when everybody started getting into the drug game. Basically, everybody on their own f the gang, you know. As the Homo tribe began to disintegrate, other Crip crews sprouted up. More rivalries developed, and the violence became epidemic. We had a couple of homicides where individuals are on the street corner and rival gang members would start literally chasing them down the street, shooting at them. Documentary TV. The whole city was crying, kids being shot and, and dying, and the city basically had enough of it at that time, and they wanted, wanted to be dealt with by whatever means necessary. They'd had it. But the loose structure of these crips made it impossible for police to build cases against them. Up here, the, the gangs are more shifting in terms of their memberships, which makes it incredibly difficult to prosecute them as organized groups. Anchorage police were frustrated and under intense pressure from the public to stop the violence. In 1995, they reached out for help to the FBI. And that's when they started sparking about, you know, we gotta get a gang task force and this, that, and the other. Before, it was just chasing us around the block because we was out past curfew. The FBI Safe Streets Task Force supplied reinforcements to Anchorage police more detectives, more prosecutors, and stiffer sentences. When they get to federal court, pursuant to the federal guidelines and statutes, many of them are looking at 10-year mandatory minimums, sometimes 20 mandatory minimums. The strategy worked. By 1998, the leadership of the Homo tribe was behind bars on drug and gun charges, including founding member Big. We all got locked up from the early 98. Put all of us away. Stomp also ended up in prison on charges related to a home invasion. The night I got caught was like, why don't you just stay home tonight? But I didn't listen. I was like, no, I'm going to go out and do what I got to do. And that led into me in jail. The law caught up with sleep as well. He was charged with first degree assault after a drive by shooting. And in 2001, he wound up behind bars. They locked up the animal that I have inside me. Can't nobody hurt me. I can't hurt nobody. The Homo tribe withered under the heat. After nearly 10 years of bloodshed, the streets of Anchorage finally seemed quiet. In 2002, months after 9-11, the FBI disbanded the Safe Streets Task Force citing the need for resources to combat terrorism. It would be a fatal mistake. No, we start popping, we start dumping. Right. People think Alaska is weak, it's not with snow. Nah, come to the summer time, partner. Anchorage, Alaska. It's the last place many expect to find hundreds of vicious crips but these streets are overrun with them. 
It's Love for Latin Crib. That's what it is. You can read it right here. You see the L and the other L. And you see the C? Love Latin Crib. That's what it stands for. We don't give a f about nobody else, man. Anchorage is a drug dealer's paradise. Bringing in narcotics from cities like Los Angeles guarantees major bank. Back home in California, it's cheaper. We triple our money out here in Alaska. Crips who move cocaine and heroin outside Anchorage to the Alaskan wilderness known as the bush can make millions. Whereas a kilo of cocaine is $15,000 in the lower 48, 30,000 in Anchorage, could be $100,000 in some of the bush communities. So you can keep doubling your profit depending on how much risk you want to take and how far you want to travel. There are other incentives for gangbangers in Anchorage. Once a year, everyone in Alaska gets a government check. Their cut of the state's oil money. Much of that dividend ends up in the hands of the Crips. Typically, we see uh, a lot of drugs being sold around the time that that permanent fund dividend comes out, and which can range anywhere from you know, approximately $1,000 upwards around $3,000. Even the bummiest person on, on the streets out here gets money. You know, and they have that money coming in to supply their habit, whether it's alcohol, dope, ice. Alaska Crips are known not only for the price of their dough, but also for its quality. Their weed was just out of this world. They had this um, Atnuska Thunder, excuse me. That was just like a one-hitter quitter. I enjoyed that when I was smoking that weed. Drug sales are also a source of weapons for Anchorage Crips. They're always willing to trade guns for drugs. People, they like to smoke, you know, they like to party, so sometimes they come with a dope man and with a 38 or a 45 just for a trade or hit, just for a hit. And you know these dope men, they're gonna take this strap. Despite the tremendous drug profits, Anchorage Crips don't battle over drug territory. There's enough money to go around. It's really amazing that there isn't more turf warfare in Anchorage over the drug dealing. It's kind of open air market. Everybody's pretty much allowed to go wherever they want to in Anchorage to deal the drugs. There is no one gang or set of individuals that owns a specific corner anywhere in town for dealing the drugs. If anything, these streets are like the Wild West. Anything goes when it comes to making money. Carjacking, stereos, speakers, selling weapons that we got from rubbing gun stores or home invasions. Whatever we could get our hands on, then we turn around and sell it. The bangers are brazen in their crimes, even when it comes to carjackings. You see these lights right here? Let's say you're driving on the street, right? I'm gonna, we we want to get by you, right? You're going to move over because the lights are flashing at you because we're the cops. We ain't the cops, the cops, but we'll f with you, though. And if you don't pull over, we might pull you over, take you out the car and take everything you got. Take your s***, don't we? Take That's your s***, and we did that. That's what's up. Some Crips use graffiti to mark their turf mostly as a warning to the few bloods in town. So right here on the north side of the store, we have some Crip graffiti. You can see we've got the uh, bright blue uh, Crip and the BK for blood killer. Alaska's weather, which can drop to 40 below, poses some interesting challenges for gangbangers. Sometimes it helps them out. One time we did a drive-by, and the cops was right around the corner. We tossed the guns into the snow banks, and we keep making for it. The snow will cover a lot of evidence. Other times, the cold weather works against them. The snow also gets you in trouble, too. It leaves your footprints. And 
know, a lot of markings. From what stories I heard, though, people hit bodies in snow. When the snow started melting, I heard bodies were coming up. When summer finally arrives in Anchorage, long-standing beefs come to the surface. As daylight hours grow longer and longer, gang crimes spike. He's been frozen for nine months, and all of a sudden, you know what I'm saying, he thawed out, everybody falling loose and cocky now. You know what I mean? It's summertime. Let's ride. In June and July, the sun barely goes below the horizon, leaving plenty of time to make trouble. We have almost 24 hours of sunshine, so people can see you on the streets or wherever, so everybody stay strapped. Majority of the time during the summer. So the summertime was, everybody knew it was on. You know, be prepared. There's one street rule in Anchorage that shocks bangers from the lower 48. In this town, snitches get off. I mean, up here, people don't really take you out. They usually let you walk around like nothing happened. This is snitches paradise up here. I mean, you can snitch at someone and still kick it with the same person you snitch with. There's no repercussion for snitches, man. There's another strange practice in Anchorage. Here, Crips jump from crew to crew, leaving a trail of enemies. I, I know one individual that's been in at least three different gangs in the last 10 years. Whatever happens to be the predominant gang of the time is what he joins. It gets confusing to try to figure out what particular gang a person's in at any particular point in time, which makes it challenging to prosecute the gang. In 2003, these challenges led to more violence, just one year after Anchorage PD had dismantled its gang task force. A new super gang began forming, pulling together gang members of every kind. They called themselves the Soldier Crew, and their mission was simple. They said, we would like you to form a coalition with us so that we can be the biggest gang in Anchorage. We don't care if you're Crip or your blood or whatever you want to do on your own time, but when we call you, we want you to be in this Soldier Crew gang. It wasn't about drugs and it wasn't about money. On the beginning, it was all about their image, that they were just trying to get their gang's name out there. From there, the gang just exploded. Anchorage, Alaska, 2003. Following 9-11, police had shut down the city's Safe Streets Task Force confident that gangs were no longer their primary threat. Now, an ambitious clique named the Soldier Crew was taking advantage of the situation, amassing an army to take control of the streets. It wasn't going to be about Crips. It wasn't going to be about Bloods. They decided if they just allowed everybody into their gang, then they could be much stronger. The crew committed crimes daily bringing together bangers for a carjacking or a home invasion and dispersing before police knew what happened. You could have 10 guys go out and do something on one night, and then out of that 10 guys, maybe two of them are good friends, and they go grab five other guys and go do something else. And you would see this kind of nebulous alliance. The cops were caught off guard. With no task force mobilizing their efforts, police were playing catch-up, unable to get a handle on this growing gang. As the soldier crew picked up members, they also picked up beefs with other gangsters across the city. Everybody was always armed, and so it was just a natural progression to shoot it out and try to solve your dispute uh, by killing each other. You got people running around with guns trying to prove a point. They just want to kill somebody and make a name for themselves. In 2003 and 2004, drive-by shootings skyrocketed. Anchorage had seen gang violence before, but this was bloodier. 
Well, mostly what is amazing is that very few of these, these homicides and these shootings were planned events. Two carloads of guys driving down the street uh, that are from opposite gangs, they happen to see each other, and their immediate reaction is to pull their guns and start shooting at each other. Even veteran Crips were shocked. In 2005, Kashawn Johnson, AKA Sleep, got out of prison after serving five years for first degree assault. He returned to the streets only to find anarchy. It seemed like they was getting younger, more reckless. It was just riding wild, just wilding out. You know what I mean? Stomp had the same reaction after serving five years for home invasion. Matter of fact, I went to a party when I first came out. I was like, what's all these young kids here? He said, oh, that's, those are the, all the new folks. And, you know, and they were all strapped up. I was like, wow, it's ridiculous. May 14, 2005. Soldier crew mentor Kentron Nevitt went into a liquor store. Two members of the rival Crips crew followed him. One of them was Tinius Tolomaivo, the Crips leader. They just happened to see a rival gang member that they had a beef with, followed him into the liquor store, uh, started to assault him. Gunfire broke out when a 15-year-old soldier crew member burst on the scene. Tinius took three bullets while chasing the team into the streets. By the time Officer Jack Carson arrived, the 15-year-old was bleeding to death. I'd actually see blood running down from behind the vehicle into the road and running down about three feet down the road. He just had enough holes in him that we just couldn't stop the bleeding. He actually had a compound fracture of his ankle uh, where one of the bullets had ex exited. And there's no ligaments, no nothing connecting it anymore. Hunter's ankle was only held on by maybe an inch of skin. The 15-year-old gunman was rushed to the hospital. He barely survived. Tinius wasn't so lucky. Tinius had entered the hospital with multiple gunshot wounds to the chest. It seemed within a minute or two that he died. A respected leader of the Crips was now dead at the hands of the soldier crew, and an unprecedented gang war broke loose. Within days, the summer of 2005 became one of the bloodiest Anchorage had ever seen. Both soldier crew members and members of rival gangs were getting killed on a large scale, which just really shocked and amazed and, and scared the citizens of Anchorage. The killings were a wake-up call to Anchorage police, who had gotten gang violence under control seven years earlier. It certainly was decided that we needed to combat this problem and devise schemes to lower the, uh, the, the rates of violence on the streets of Anchorage. One month after the liquor store shootout, the FBI and Anchorage PD announced they were reassembling the Safe Streets Task Force. It wasn't a moment too soon. The Crips were shooting anyone, anywhere. Gangsters weren't even safe in their own homes. On August 9th, 2005, a member of the soldier crew named Marcus Watkins was sitting on his couch watching a movie when a barrage of bullets ripped through the walls of his living room. Individuals shot numerous rounds into the residence and striking him while he was on the couch and he later died from those gunshot wounds. Police never determined who was responsible for the brazen execution. When your victim is dead and all of your witnesses are gang members and, and refuse to talk, you typically cannot prosecute those crimes. By January 2006, the Safe Streets Task Force was finally back to work full force. By now, they had a full-scale gang war on their hands. I mean, 
it was constant fights going on between the, the different gangs. Almost nightly, we were responding to shots fired in areas. It was just drive-by after drive-by. But best believe, we got the hands. Because, you know, we throw it down anytime. Now we got this, my Anchorage, Alaska, January 2006. A brutal gang war forced the FBI and Anchorage police to put its Safe Streets Task Force back to work. One of their major weapons, stiff federal sentences for gun crimes. There's a, a federal statute which is uh, quite powerful that's called uh, using or carrying a firearm in furtherance of a drug trafficking crime or crime of violence. So if you're looking at five years on a drug sentence and you have a gun, it automatically becomes 10 years. So those cases and those charges can't be dismissed or bargained down at all. Just as it did in the 1990s, the task force produced dramatic results. The leaders of the soldier crew, a super gang who'd wreaked havoc against Crips in Anchorage for three years, ended up behind bars. An informant started buying drugs from them. We were, we were able to basically eliminate almost all the original leaders of the gang. Those left on the streets are feeling the pressure. They come with guns drawn. First time I got pulled over when I got out, you know the routine. I looked at them. My routine, get out the cars, spread your legs, we're gonna search everything. I was looking like, damn, it's like that? The Crips are losing their claim on the streets, but a new generation of gangbangers is emerging with ties that stretch across the globe. I mean, most of us we ain't even from here. I'm from Panama City. 507. Salvadorian. Two from one LA. Three, two one three. New York. Two one three. New York. As alliances change, one aspect of gang life remains unchanged. There's money to be made on these streets. It's all this money flowing in Alaska that makes these kids go crazy for it. I always say that money make people funny out here. These new gangsters are disturbing to old school crips like Sabrina. In 2003, Sabrina lost her husband to a heart attack. She got out of the drug business and says it's for good. I'm just tired of sleeping with one eye open. It just gets violent. It just gets ugly, you know, with especially the children. And you just have to make a change. She keeps a close eye on her children. I have an older child that worried me whole lot. He was just hanging out with the group and dealing with drugs and I worried about him and just getting killed. It's a concern Stomp shares. I went on my son's MySpace and that's all he had on his MySpace was Crip this, Crip that, blue rag on and I was like damn, I need to put my foot down and stop before it gets worse. After almost a dozen years as a Crip, Stomp says he's moved on with his life and regrets his time in the gang. My sons think it's, it's cool that, that their dad was, was part of the gang back in the day. And I, I keep telling them, no, it's not cool. Because, you know, look, where, look what happened to me, so. Sleep has stayed out of prison since 2005 and also says his Crip days are over. Something had to change. I got kids, I got a wife. You know, continue doing the stuff that I was doing before really don't make no sense. And a lot of that was going on, misplaced loyalty, being loyal to the wrong people, and then they turn around and on you, you know? Other gangbangers like Big have no intention of leaving the streets. Some of us are doing time, but we still out there. We ain't gonna fade away. Those who have survived the violence here 
predict that this frontier will never become tamed. They're not going to stop me, you know. They won't. Regardless, they can do the gang sweep, but they ain't never going to stop this. It's going to progress because that's what it's done. It went from mild to hot to super spicy to it's going to get to the point where the cops might end up even being scared to go into certain places. It's going to progress. They're just carrying AK-47s in their cars. Come on, that is not normal. It's getting even crazier in Alaska and Anchorage. Documentary TV.